Okay. Now, what I was going to do today is talk about this as one of the five topics that I'll be going through, uh, the financial crisis and the role that's so uh, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis is an explanation for where the crisis in 2008 came from, and then mainly a fair bit of theoretical work about that. But that screen, is that seeable or should I turn the front lights off, by the way? Is that okay? All right, okay. All right? Yeah, okay. Uh, then, of course, that was my intention for the, for the day to talk about this guy. Then this bloke turned up on the weekend. He was surprised by his election. Shocked? Yeah. You weren't shocked? What, you, you thought it was going to happen? or? Pardon? He was going to win or? Go either way. It was very, very close. I, I was relying upon the polls, which I also did for Brexit. Of course, that, they were wrong on Brexit. I'm one of the few economists who is in favour of Brexit, not for its impact upon the English economy because of what I thought of the European Union. But this one, again, I relied on the polls and I got it completely wrong. Apparently, Hillary did win the primary, like in terms of the aggregate number of Americans. She's about half a million votes ahead out of 100 million between the two of them. But given this electoral college system they have, he's got by far the majority of the electoral college. And that's what matters. Those are the people who then decide who becomes president. So he's going to be president of the United States because he starts in, in January and there's a whole lot of stuff is going to turn completely upside down. So one thing I, when that happened, I woke up on Sunday. Was it when, when, when would it have been? It was um, Friday morning. Yesterday. Pardon? Yesterday. I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting lost. I was up in. I, I woke up this morning in North Scotland, by the way. So I was slightly tired at various points, but disjointed. I've been up since five forty, catching about twelve forms of transportation to get here. Uh, but I was up in St Andrews at the university up there. Uh, last night, and on the way, I wrote this piece, uh, which is related to what I'm talking about in the lecture today, because now we have a, a president who actually has a history of deliberately defaulting upon his debts, you know, not under the part of Trump's history, but he's declared bankruptcy, I think it is. Oh, my God, we've got here, pardon me, advertisements on this website. Uh, take a walk on the wild side, and do that's what's happening. Um... Well, so what happened? Oh, no. Oh, I've been... This dreadful virus. I've been trying to get rid of this thing. Thanks, man. It's called the Brit Method, by the way. It just comes out of absolutely nowhere. 700. I installed the spyware, so I tried to get rid of the bloody thing yesterday, and it's now come back. I don't know how to get rid of it. I think I'll be reformatting the computer, computer over the weekend. So sorry about that total crazy diversion. But I wrote this piece... For Forbes magazine, I have a column in Forbes, and it's on much of the topic I'll be talking about in the lecture today. But my argument to Trump was his slogan is to make America great again. And I say, if you want to make it great again, write off the private debt. And that's something he's done in his own history several times. Uh, you, you, did you see the item about how he probably didn't pay any tax in the last 20 years? Okay, because he declared roughly, I think it was a $912 million loss one year, and then with the result of that loss, had no taxes to pay. Effectively, we don't know what he's done, but he didn't probably... He had a $50 million a year write-off for 20 years, uh, and he also has declared bankruptcy at various times. So he's not somebody who regards debt as sacrosanct and it must be repaid. So I thought I'd take advantage of that and write a little post saying, if you want to make the country great again, pay the debt, uh, write the debt off, because no, we're going to be leading to that in today's lecture. That's... Uh, picture of the level of private debt in America since 18, the 1830s, ratio of private debt to GDP. And it was down as low as 10% back in 1865, uh, reached a peak during the Great Depression of about 1.4 times GDP. And the crisis that we've been through in America peaked with a debt level of 1.7 times GDP and they're currently at 1.5. So I want to talk about, from an economic point of view, why that is crucial for understanding why Trump ended up being a successful candidate, despite virtually everything he did to alienate the electorate beforehand. I don't think there's anybody in the actual electorate who didn't actually insult. Can you think of any groups he didn't insult? It's pretty hard. Okay. But he still won the majority. So what's actually going on behind that to give us that sort of effect? And I think the work of Hyman Minsky 
is a major explanation as to why. So I want to take you through Hyman Minsky's logic right now. If you remember last year, I, the way that I, paraf- that I tried to paraphrase how economists approach economic issues is they'll start with a particular question that defines their approach to thinking about the economy. So the, the approach that the mainstream has, which you've learned in the principles course and you're doing again in various ways and courses here in the next couple of years, is how does a free market economy achieve general equilibrium? That's the basic question they pose for themselves. Whereas Minsky's question was, can a Great Depression happen again? And that's actually the way he phrased it. Can it, a Great Depression, happen again? And if it can happen, why didn't it happen in the wars in the years since World War II? He was writing in 1982 at that stage. So he's saying we had pretty much 35 to 40 years of no serious financial crisis. Whereas you look at the historical record, you find that in the, certainly in the 19th century America, so the, the Wild West years, uh, there was a financial crisis every 10 to 15 years. If you go back and take a look at that chart again, I'll just uh, try to – this is actually showing the level of level of debt, but I, I can show the downturns occurring. At, whenever you see it de- declining here, heading down, that normally coincides with and causes a crisis, and I'll explain the logic behind it beforehand. So you had dozens of these crises, or about eight of those crises in America in the, in the 1800s. The Great Depression in the 1930s was probably the biggest and the the worst, but it was not out of the ordinary. So his point was for us to go from 1945 to 1982 when he wrote this uh, paragraph without having a huge financial crisis was was out of the ordinary. But, of course, we, when we're born into a particular time in history, that's not the only time we know, really know. So people's perceptions of how the economy functions, this certainly coming to the economics you've been taught, were shaped by a period of incredible stability. And then they projected that as the normal state of the economy, whereas Minsky was quite different. He was saying that the normal state, or the state we have to understand, is the Great Depression. So the question is, why, why did he make that the focus of his work? Because he was certainly a maverick. Uh, there were, there's, as you're probably aware from being at Kingston, there's a range of non-orthodox economists uh, as well as the mainstream. It's always been a, t- a minority, something of the order of between 5 and 20% of the profession who are critics of the mainstream in some way and stand outside it. So Minsky wasn't alone in being like this. What was very different about him was the approach he took to thinking about the Great Depression and why he made it the, the focus. Well, you look at his age, and again, this is why I think it's important to think about when people were born. He was 10 years old at the time the Depression began and he was living in a left-wing family. His parents were both Russian refugees from the from uh, from uh, the uh, takeover of Russia by the Bolsheviks in 1917. And I don't know how much you know about uh, Russian politics. Do you know that the, you've heard of the term Bolshevik? Have you? Who hasn't heard of it? Okay. Bolshevik was the title that Lenin's group gave to themselves as radicals who were trying to overthrow the feudal system in Russia and bring in socialism. And their argument was you could go straight from, from feudalism to, cap- to, to socialism. You did, they didn't see it as necessary to go through the capitalist phase. They thought that the socialist go- government could industrialise what was at the time very much a feudal peasant society, whereas there was a rival group, also radicals, also believing in a Marxian vision of the economy, but more strictly following Marx, who called themselves the Mensheviks. And the Mensheviks said, no, you have to go through a capitalist stage. So even though they expected the feudal system in Russia to break down, they expected that the Tsar the was killed in, um, in, in the late First World War, they, saw that this, they thought the feudal system had to collapse. But they thought after it collapsed, there'd then be a capitalist period. That would industrialise Russia, and then socialism would come after that. Now... Minsky's parents came from the Menshevik wing. So when the Bolsheviks became the successful revolutionaries, they weren't very popular and they left. So they turn up in Chicago. This is where Minsky's raised. And you have in, I think it was Chicago, I'm pretty certain of that. I'll better check and make sure later. Um, But then when Minsky was a mere 10 years old, the Great Depression begins and you had a huge increase in unemployment. Now you've all um, seen the unemployment that occurred after the 2007-2008 crisis here, which, in my opinion, laughably was blamed on the Labor Party, 
successfully by the Tories, but it was nothing like the unemployment rate you saw in America uh, back in the 19, 1930s because the unemployment rate peaked at about 12% when America tried to go back onto the gold standard after the First World War. You then had a long period where the unemployment rate bounced between 2 and 4%, so quite a low rate of unemployment. And people, remember what this period was called? The, what's the nickname for the 1920s? Do you know it? Pardon? There's a particular name it's given. Pardon? No. No, that's actually the first of the 18, 1890s, but that's, that was an earlier period, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, the Roaring Twenties. It's called the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, good one. Okay. So if you isn't he was in the great movie The Great Gatsby. Okay, that's that talks about that particular age as well. So it was the Roaring Twenties, the economy was roaring. Look at the unemployment rate. It's lower than America's experienced ever since. The current unemployment rate in America is about four point nine percent. I think the figures are cooked. I'll talk about that in a moment. But nonetheless, for the whole of that period, very low unemployment, and in fact when the crisis began, the way the, the unemployment was actually recorded at 0% of the population. And well, the reason is the way they defined unemployment back then was, are you registered as unemployed? So if you registered as unemployed at the dole office, which there was no dole, so far as I'm aware, it was a very, very trivial payment. But if you registered as unemployed, then you were counted. If you didn't register, you weren't. And the, the percentage of the population that was registered was so close to zero that the actual recorded percentage was zero in 1929. Then it blew up to 26%. Okay. So that's not youth unemployment. That's the average for the entire country. Okay. So that's how huge the unemployment was in the Great Depression. It then fell, and this is important to notice this, from 26% down to 11%, with a couple of ups and downs, but fairly steady reduction in unemployment until 1937. And then it rose back up again to 20% just before the Second World War. Then it started to trend down. We got to the low levels after that. But Minsky was 10 when this happened. Okay. And, of course, in a left-wing family, being critics of capitalism, expecting capitalism to collapse at some stage, that was the background he had. Now, to give you an idea of just how how, how dreadful it was for people, it's, this looks like a fairly responsible guy, wouldn't you say, except for his taste in moustaches. Okay. This is a cover of a, of a women's magazine in Sydney, in Australia. Uh, and what happened was people who couldn't find work would go walking around what they called the Wallaby Track in Australia, offering themselves for work at whatever farm they turned up at in return for food and lodgings. And America had similar types of phenomena. So it was that severe, that state of mind. So very, very different to what we had even, even this time around. Now, it began... Uh, in September 1929, which happens to be Minsky's 10th birthday. And what you, when you look at what happened with the stock market, that's the crash that occurred. So the stock market, how anybody could not notice that there was a bubble from 1924 to 1929 on, when you look back on it, it's just breathtaking. And people thought that was normal and would go on indefinitely. But then it peaked up here at 381 in September of 1929, and by the time it had fallen out completely, about three years later, or less than three years later, it was down to 41 points. Now, that's a 90% fall in the stock market. In today's terms, that'd be like the, the uh, S&P going from you know, roughly 20,000 points to 2,000. And of course, if people's wealth tied up in share market, that's an enormous destruction of wealth. So... When you look, look back and look at that crisis, how would Minsky's parents have reacted to it? I imagine they would have been extra cheerful on Hyman's birthday. I don't know. I must actually find out what happened in terms of employment for his parents. But politically, that's what they, they would have seen this as a, as a sign of the breakdown of capitalism, which they expected coming from their family background, both from the Mensheviks party, as I've mentioned. And they accepted Marx's argument. They rejected the idea that you could go straight from a feudal society which is agricultural. The, the, the basis of, of employment and work in Russia was a feudal system still at the beginning of the, 19th, the 20th century and breaking down. But they, the, 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 Bol the Bolsheviks argued they could go straight from that rural state right across to industrialised uh, socialism without going through a capitalist period. And the Mensheviks just refused that. 
Now, you won't find, and this is important in terms of how you understand people who wrote in America in the 1950s, if they're left-wing in their views at all, and also the nature of the economics you were taught, you're being taught as well, because Minsky never, not once, cited Marx, either as a reference or a quote, in his entire body of academic work. And the reason was a guy called Joe McCarthy. I don't know if you've used that a name, McCarthyist, is that okay? I'm not quite certain how much history you guys know, that's why I keep on asking there. Now, he was a classic corrupt United States politician who was, uh, we'd, we'd have to, we, these days you call him a sociopath. Sociopaths are people who, enjoy, who don't have any compunction whatsoever about lying and do it for their own personal advantage. And he would stand up regularly holding up a piece of paper saying, I have a list here of all the Communist Party sympathisers in the State Department. There was no list. He's just making it up all the way through. But that led to a, really what was you can call a witch hunt against anybody who was seen as having communist sympathies in any area of America, American prominence. So the government, the media, there was what's called the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Okay? And any academic who admitted to reading Marx, let alone accepting Marx, would end up losing their job. So there's no way you could actually admit to it. It was actually literally grounds for being sacked. So you won't find any reference to Marx there, but to understand Minsky, you have to know Marx because he admits it in private. And uh, I had a, a fun exposure to this. I met, uh, I met Minsky once, uh, but only very briefly when I was doing my PhD uh, at the University of New South Wales about 30 years ago. But I met his son when I was writing Debunking Economics. I was actually writing the book in Minsky's office in the Levy Institute in upstate New York. And Alan told me that he um, had a sort of, not a falling out, but they, the usual father-son conflict that tends to happen and didn't go his dad's direction. He went into the media rather than into economics. But then he got curious about economics in his 30s and he asked his father, which book should I read first to start learning economics? He said, Dad went into the into the study and came out and said, this is the volume you should read, and gave him a copy of Das Kapital, Volume 1. So Marx played a huge role in fitting up um, Minsky's thoughts about how the economy operates, but he didn't follow the conventional arguments about what's called the labour theory of value. Have you had that explained to you at all? I might talk about that in, in tutorials perhaps if we need to. But he was influenced by Marx's writing on, on finance, and they weren't in the first volume of Capital, that's where you have to start reading from. It's in the <coughs> second and third volumes and a number of other books, uh, one called the Grundrisse, which is uh, like Marx's notes, just notes that he was re reading in the British Library, notes that he put together about capitalism. And if you read those notes, you'll find things like this by Marx, talking about in the 1850s, said a high rate of interest can also indicate the country is undermined by, and I love this phrase, the roving cavaliers of credit. So he's really he's both attacking and satirising the financial sector, who can afford to pay a high interest because they paid out of other people's pockets, meanwhile living in the grand style and anticipated profits. So he was a strong critic of the financial sector, and you don't normally see that when people read Marx. They don't often go beyond volume one of Capital or even little books like Wage, Labour and Capital. And he then says this can also provide a profitable business for manufacturers and others, and returns become wholly deceptive. In other words, what looks like a profitable business is, in fact, a, a scam financed by debt. So this sort of wisdom is something you can find in Marx, and I'm fairly – I don't – I can't prove it because I, you actually have to find Minsky's handwritten notes somewhere on Marx. God knows where they are. Um, but that is the sort of thing which set up his framework for thinking about how capitalism functions. And equally, this is Marx again saying that by the financial sector – enables a class of parasites the power to not only despoil industrial capitalists, but to interfere with actual production in the most dangerous matter, and this gang knows nothing about production and has nothing to do with it. So this is the mindset that Minsky had when he approached economics. And Minsky took that argument from, from, uh, from actually the experience of being a child during the Great Depression in a left-wing family, where these books were on the shelves, uh, but also from actually reading those books and seeing Marx's wisdom there.
So the other influences you have are a guy called Joseph Schumpeter. Heard that name? I spoke a bit about him in Becoming an Economist last year. Take a look at the, the notes again. He did a lot of what's called evolutionary economics. And he saw capitalism as necessarily unstable, but he saw that as a good thing. And this is something which I think you have to think about as well, because a lot of the critics of capitalism talk about being unstable, therefore bad. And the neoclassicals talk about it being stable, therefore good. But Schumpeter was saying, well, it's got instability, but that instability leads to creativity. And that's a good thing. He saw it as a positive thing. What actually he argued was that people who are entrepreneurs, people like you know Richard, uh, Richard Branson, uh, Elon Musk today, they make a profit by disturbing that equilibrium. With systems in equilibrium, they can see an advantage, like moving from physical cars to, to uh, from, from cars powered by oil to cars powered by solar energy. Um, solar has systems for the households, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, disrupting the power systems we currently have that rely upon coal etc., etc., and he saw finance playing an essential role for them because to Schumpeter, an entrepreneur, a person like Branson in his early days, was somebody who had a good idea but no money. So he thought what happened was they got the money from the finance sector to turn those good ideas in, into actual products, and that's where innovation came from. And then you'd have a boom because all this money was being spent by the entrepreneurs to both to set up their business but also to buy goods and services they need from other industries to, to build those new products. And then when those products came online, they'd cause a slump because they would undercut other products at the time. So my favourite example there is the whole area of the MP3 players, iPods, iPhones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Has anybody here not got a smartphone? Okay. You've all got them these days. If I asked 30 years ago what people had as a portable music device, what would they have had? Walkman, yeah, the old little cassette tapes things, mini cassette tapes. So when those, when when MP3 players first came out, they destroyed the market for Walkmans. That was dominated by Sony at the time. Apple wiped them out of the market in that sense. So, and when that happens, as well as undermining the products, they repay the debt, and you get a boom and bust cycle coming out of that, which Mitsuki, which John Peter saw as a good thing. And he said he explains the cycles by a chain of causation running from um, the appearance of new enterprises undermining the profitability of old ones. And it's necessarily discontinuous. You have a, a product is invented um, and it, rather than just being a smooth invention of products over time and smooth progress, he says everything lumps together. And the reason for this is that um, you initially, uh, the first person who comes out with an MP3 player is the very first product and suddenly it's cutting into the market elsewhere. So somebody who thinks they can design a better MP3 player can potentially get finance to put that idea into, into practice. So you get an explosion of new technology coming out of this, which causes a boom as the finance turns up in the, in the economy. And Schumpeter also emphasised that innovation would come out of new companies rather than out of old ones. Now, sometimes that's not the case, but he put the most extreme situation that entrepreneurs he saw as people that had good ideas but no money. Therefore, they're not part of an existing firm which can actually finance it itself. Can you think of a, a firm that would have started off with almost no money and disrupted a major industry that you were all part of? You're looking at one of them right now. Apple, yeah. They, they actually got the money by selling their comedy van, so I believe. They didn't actually get money from finance. But the innovation came out of small companies like that, a company called Compaq. You heard anybody heard of Compaq? They've come and gone. But they, they invented, the, they made the first, um, well, not the first, but the first successful portable computer. And they turned up and undermined IBM and all the big companies at the time. So what you get initially when they start turning up, as well as disrupting the existing industry, they get a huge amount of finance that means a boom occurs. And the boom occurs across the entire economy. And then as that turns up, you've got, the, the, as the products are being invented and the boom is spreading more and more widely, everything gets more expensive because you're, you're, you're competing to get labour, you're competing to get inputs, you're driving up the price of everything. Um, but then 
as this, as this goes on, you've got a period of inflation and, and growth and, and boom. But then the products come online. And when they come online, they undercut and they cause a slump. So you start off with a finance, uh, with one invention gets finance and others in the same area can also get finance. Success in one industry spreads to others. So you think about back in the 1990s, you had the telecommunications industry in many ways taking off and then the dot-com industries taking off on top of the telecommunications. So you had a, a spread of industries through which the wealth was going. And then people who are building things like telecommunication cables eat sushi. So you get a spread of the prosperity to industries that aren't related directly, but when they necessarily need to buy those, those other products. But once those products turn up, they undercut everything else. So you get the, the MP3 players turn up and suddenly you can't sell cassette tape players anymore. So you, your success as a new product undermines the success of other industries, drives people into unemployment and causes a slump. So Sean Peter saw this natural cycle, boom, slump, boom, slump, boom, slump over time. And he saw it as part of the creative process of capitalism, had a very, very positive attitude towards it. And he saw that was an essential feature of the way that capitalism progresses. But what he ignored was he's talking about people borrowing money to invest in something and then paying that money back when the boom uh, goes, turns into a slump. But he didn't think what actually happens to the level of debt over time. Now, that's where Minsky came in, because Minsky, uh, the other key influence that Minsky had before he started being supervised by Schumpeter for his PhD was a guy called Irving Fisher. Have you heard the Fisher name at all? Okay. And he had a, um, not Minsky, uh, well, Schumpeter, Fisher began with a very benign view of what finance was like, and then he lost $100 million in the stock market crash, uh, roughly $100 million in our terms, about $10 million at the time. Um, so that made him rather less uh, positive about finance. And he began by saying that uh, when you're looking at that boom I showed you beforehand, he said the boom was going to go on forever. He thought the valuation that I showed you on that chart for 1929 were completely justified. And literally about eight, this is about eight days before the financial crisis began, um, or so six days, I think. He says, stock prices have reached like, like what looks like a permanently high plateau. In other words, they've reached this high level, they're not going to go down. And most people, that's most people only, only know that part of the quote. He kept on going. This is in a newspaper article. And said he don't think there'll ever be a 50 or 60 point break below present levels, such as Mr. Babson, who was a bear commentator in the same newspaper, had predicted. He said, I expect to see the stock market a good deal higher than it is today within a few months. This is being published in a major newspaper by America's most respected economist eight days before the stock market crash. It lost 10% in a single day, which is almost, I think that's pretty close to the 50 points um, that he said would never ever happen. And four years later, it was down 90% and he lost $10 million, which in our money terms is about $100 million. So it's a substantial collapse to go into. And that... In the aftermath, he tried to explain why on earth did this happen? Why didn't I see it coming? Okay. What did I get wrong to not see this happening? And what actually caused it? And the argument was that, well, the theory that he was raised in, the, the neoclassical theory that you guys still get taught today, but critically here, it assumes equilibrium. Okay. So as soon as you get supply and demand, you know, demand matches supply in the individual market and aggregate demand and aggregate supply, the same thing. And and so on. And he said, okay, well, you might actually believe that these systems markets head towards equilibrium, but even if they do, there are always going to be shocks. And since there's going to be a shock, the odds are that any variable is going to be above or below that equilibrium level. So you can't start thinking about it in an equilibrium way. As soon as you say that there are disturbances, even when you're modeling the world as, a, as an equilibrium system, once you say there are disturbances, you're going to have virtually every variable above or below that equilibrium level. It won't start at equilibrium. And therefore, and this is a, he's not particularly um, fancy writer compared to Keynes, but he said, it is absurd to assume that the variables in the economy will stay in perfect equilibrium as to assume the Atlantic Ocean can never be without a wave. 
In other words, if you try to reason from the point of view of the ocean being flat in the absence of waves, forget it. You're not going to even get to first base about how the ocean actually behaves. And the same for the economy. So he said, you'll be starting from some disequilibrium position. And that's an essential part of his thinking that the mainstream doesn't get because he has a disequilibrium theory of how the Great Depression came about. And that theory uh, was that the, the two factors that are the main factors in causing a depression are too much debt, so excessive debt, and inflation being too low. Now, that's rather like the situation we're in today, which is why this is so relevant to what we're going through right now. And again, I think this is why Trump, to bring it back to that, um, the opening point I made about Trump, if we weren't in this sort of situation, somebody like Trump would never have got elected. I want to show you how severe that situation is uh, at the end of the lecture. So you, you said overinvestment, overspeculation, these all, all matter, but they're not important unless you have borrowed money involved. And this was a very important point from his own personal experience because I said he, was, he lost $10 million at the time of the crash, $100 million in our, in our terms, $10 million back then. He had $1 million in actual wealth, and he'd taken out margin loans to buy shares. Are you aware of what margin loans are? Okay. A margin loan is where you borrow money from a share or a broker, you come with a deposit of a million dollars, so you can buy a million dollars worth of shares. And what the broker says is, don't buy the shares with your own, own cash. I'll lend you nine million, so you can buy $10 million worth of shares. And then if the shares go up by 10%, so they go from 10 million to 11 million, you've doubled your money. You've gone from 1 million to 2 million in actual money that's yours, minus what I'm going to charge you in interest. So a large part of the share market ownership back in the 1920s was on the same story. They were buying shares on margin, which means they were putting like a 10% deposit down to buy a house. But the house was a share, it was a share portfolio, and the shares could go up and down quite dramatically, but the belief was that always go up. So you got locked into that. Now, the dangerous thing about a margin line is that you're supposed to maintain the value of your portfolio at the aggregate level. It can't, it's not supposed to fall down below that level. So because Fisher had taken out, he had $1 million in cash, let's say, he'd taken out a $9 million loan to buy $10 million worth of shares, he had to make sure his portfolio was worth $10 million or more at all times. So that fell, let's say there's a 10% rise, that's fine. He's gone from $10 million to $11 million. But if this 10% fall, he's gone from 10 million to 9 million. The broker is entitled to ring him up and say, We're making a margin call. You have to top us up from 9 million to 10 million. Now, if you answer, I haven't got another million, they'll say, Well, that's tough luck. Sell your house. And literally, there's no limit to their capacity to demand you hand over whatever you own to make up the margin call. That's why it's such a, a scary thing. These days, margins were for a while limited to 50%. I think margin loans are now back allowed to be 70%, so they put down $3 million to buy $10 million worth. But when Fisher went through this experience, they were unregulated, and the normal margin loan was, was 90%. So they put down $1 million, borrow nine, buy $10 million of shares with $1 million in cash. Works brilliantly when market's going up. It causes a... It destroys you when the market goes down, and that's what happened to him. So I noticed, I think this wonderful line here reflects that. He was incredibly confident about the state of the market back in the 1920s and was destroyed. He said, I fancy that overconfidence, and he was clearly overconfident, seldom does much great harm except when, as, and if it beguiles his victims into debt. So he just saw himself as being a personal victim of debt, and he now wanted to explain how this situation of too much debt with very low rate of inflation can cause a crisis that gets worse and worse. So the basic argument is you start with people being in debt who therefore have to, have to sell. And they're going to try to sell, you know, it's a fire sale, you know, the expression of fire sale. And because they, when they pay the debt down, they reduce the amount of money in circulation. If you pay your debt down, You've, reduced the, you've, you've used your money to pay off your debt. Your debts have fallen, but your money, your bank account, falls by the same amount. So there's actually a contraction in the amount of money in the economy. 
Now, that then means prices fall because people are distressed selling. They're dropping prices to try to move things. So they sell a car for half the retail price. They put a 70% discount on everything in the shop. And back in the 1920s, it was mainly business people who were in debt. There, was, there wasn't a lot of household mortgage there. It was mainly businesses in debt. So that means prices fall. But because prices fall, and the value of the businesses also fall. And so they, a lot of businesses go bankrupt. When they go bankrupt, what they're going to do is reduce output, sack workers, and reduce turnover, which means everybody gets more pessimistic and loses confidence in general, which, of course, was the state of the 1930s, and therefore people hoard money. So any money you do have, you spend much more slowly, so the turnover of money also slows down. And when you start getting, constantly because of all these effects, you get uh, the interest rate drops down towards zero in nominal terms. But because prices are falling, so you actually got negative inflation, that means the real rate is actually positive. And that's, you know, if you take a look at what happened in the 1930s, and uh, Fisher was quite right about that. So that was, that was the, the background. Those are the intellectual backgrounds for, for Minsky. Keynes is a foundation. Fisher, as the first person, he was... Um, he, he thought he explained the Great Depression well, and then Schumpeter with a cyclical vision. So Minsky tried to bring all this together and build an understanding of what he called financial instability. And to explain why it hadn't happened for those years between 1945 and 1965, and he again expressed this as quite brilliantly. Uh, if you, I, I do recommend reading Minsky, but I recommend which book you should read as well. There's a little book of readings called Can It Happen Again? Okay. It's about, I think it's about, it's been reprinted now. It was out of print for decades. When I bought it, it cost me $150. Um, that was back in 1987. I think now you can buy it for 15 pounds as a paperback. Okay, so, and it's little essays, 20-page 20, 20 essays max. Very readable, and this is one of those essays. It's the most significant event of the era since World War II is something that has not happened. There's not been, it has not been a deep and long-lasting depression. And he said to go, when you look at the history, looking particularly at the 1900s, 1800s in America, the 19th century, to go more than 35 years without a depression is a striking success because these depressions occurred regularly in the 1800s. The 1930s, the Great Depression, was just a bigger and better version of what had happened quite regularly, roughly every 10 to 15 years during the 1800s. So something was right from Minsky's point of view about the institutions and the economic circumstances of the period in 1945 and 1965, and then it's all gone wrong since, which is where we've got to here. So he wanted to build a mathematical model of this as well, uh, and he hadn't read Keynes when he started. And again, this is one reason we, we, we teach courses at Kingston, we do want you to read original works. So I'm going to, I think for today's tutorial and seminar, I'm going to be stuck in talking about Trump. I think it's just such a remarkable thing to have happen. Uh, but what I, will, what I was going to do is give you these three readings that I'd like you to read for next week, uh, which will give you a flavour of, of both Keynes and Minsky. So what I'll do that, we'll do that in the, in the class. But Keynes himself hadn't read, uh, Minsky himself hadn't read Keynes when he started developing this hypothesis. He'd only read what he read in textbooks. You're, you, you used Sloman last year, didn't you, in your Policies and Principles course? Is that right, Sloman, I think? Are you using a text... In the macro course this year, what's the textbook? Is the author? Thank you. We've got somebody doing research here. Yeah. Pardon? Can't. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that. That would be the. I don't know what it's like in terms of its model of Keynes, but it'd be teaching you the ISOM model and things like that. Well, that's what Minsky learned when he was going through his university degree, and there's also. Um, what's called a multiplier accelerator model of the trade cycle. And that's is mathematics, that's what it is. It says output this year is a couple of constants times output the year before minus one of those constants times the output two years ago. You ever seen that one before? Okay, I'll take you through that um, at a later stage. So that's output today. That's output one year ago. That's output two years ago. And... One minus, alpha is also, you can call it the multiplier, one minus the savings rate. Okay. You've done the idea of the aggregate to aggregate demand equation and the idea of the, the multiplier. Well, that's the multiplier term. Whereas the beta, 
um, which I normally use C for. And in my in the, when I when I express was it, he's using a beta in this particular paper. That's the ratio of capital to output accelerator. And the model had what's called explosive behavior. It had high values for C, then the cycles get bigger and bigger over time. I can give you an illustration of that in the second half of the lecture. Now, most people treated that as a constant. Minsky's idea was, well, let's treat it as a variable. Let's say that accelerator relationship changes depending on how optimistic investors are. And he made it decline. So he said over time that coefficient uh, is part of the efficiency of investment, uh, but it's also willing to how relates to how willing investors are to take on risks as they try to finance their investment. And uh, complicated model, that was part of his PhD, but it went nowhere. And I, it's fairly easy to show there's a logical fallacy in the model he was actually building it from. But it was based on a textbook idea of what Keynes wrote. So he actually had this, when he's trying to explain his model in his thesis, uh, and with a couple of later papers, he made this statement here saying, if we take the Keynesian assumption that consumption demand is independent of interest rates, but assume that investment demand depends upon interest rates, then as interest rates rises, the beta coefficient will fall. Now, that's his vision of what Keynes was about. What I want you to do for next week, and I'll, I'll give you the reference in the tutorial, is to read a paper by Keynes called The General Theory of Employment. Anybody heard of that? You heard of the book called The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money. Have you heard of a paper by Keynes called The General Theory of Employment? Okay. It's 15 pages. Not long, okay. but it's Keynes' 1937 summary of what he thought was new and original in his 1936 book. And that's uh, where, where Minsky first realised that what he thought was Keynes wasn't Keynes at all. So he was, well, if you first read it just by accident, I'm not quite certain how he came across or decided to read the paper. But in reading it, his reaction was, this is nothing like what I was taught in my textbooks. Absolutely nothing like it. And he said, when he looked back, why, where did the textbook version come from? Then it's derived from an article by John Hicks called Mr. Keynes and the Classics. And he said, this article misses Keynes' point completely. But that was the foundation of the textbook interpretation of Keynes. So Minsky jumped away from that and said, this just doesn't make any sense at all. Now, he largely gave up trying to do the mathematical modelling at that stage. And he started developing this thesis as a blend of Marx and Schumpeter talking about how capitalism is fundamentally unstable. Schumpeter, and this is, I'll explain this uh, later in the lecture as well, explaining how banks create money out of nothing, okay. creating money and demand. It's an essential part of Minsky's logic. And Fisher, yeah. Fisher's argument about debt deflation, and then Keynes talking about how investors behave when they're uncertain about the future, which is all the time. So it's a combination of it. I went to that last one a bit too quickly. That, those... those what I see is the four main factors that gave Minsky this vision to explain where cycles and instability come from. And they've become much more relevant now because we're back in uh, the same situation that Minsky was talking about for this, the 1930s. So if you look at where the, the inspirations on Keynes, in, in the sort of stuff you've done, the ISLM model and the aggregate to aggregate demand model, that's very much comes from Hicks's thinking rather than Keynes. There's some parts in the general theory where you can find things that look like it because the general theory is a, a mishmash of a book, in my opinion. But at one point he talks about, in Chapter 17, on one single page, he says that uh, people invest because they want to make assets they can sell for more than their production price. Okay? The, the, the desire to produce investment goods is motivated by the desire to produce assets whose uh, cost price is less than the demand price. So the supply cost price was determined by the cost of production and demand was determined by what you thought the good would earn you as profit over time. So you thought you could buy something cheaply and make an enormous profit out of it by selling what it produced over time, you'd have to put a much higher price on buying it than it cost to manufacture. So the prospective yields are based on what you think is going to happen in the future. So Keynes was arguing here that there are two price levels in capitalism. There's the normal commodities, which he said is pretty much based on a markup on cost. So you have the cost of production, you put a profit margin on top of it, that pretty much sets the prices for the normal commodities. But assets were based upon your expectations about the future when you're uncertain about the future. 
and there's just a touch of that in the 1936 book, but it becomes absolutely prominent in the 1937 paper, The General Theory of Employment, which we'll talk about after we take a bit of a break. So I'll dive very heavily into theory here rather than empirical. I'll come back to the empirical later. So can I hand over to the um, student reps to do that checking about the um, feedback? Okay. So I'll get out of the room. I'll go sit out in the uh, corridor for about, what, 10 to 15 minutes? And you can guys can put it all together and I'll come back at that stage. Okay. I just saw, in terms of those, I imagine. Um, so I'll, 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 I take those those points are quite valid because we we change the lecturers for this course depending on who's available at different times, and therefore there's not enough coordination in the lecture content itself. So I'll just that we'll get some more feedback about that from you in the tutorial anyway. But let's get on with the material here, which is going to be overwhelming, but I'll try to bring it uh, to be more comprehensible in the seminar itself. And also, I'll get you to read some of the some key papers for next week that will give you a bit more background on where all this stuff comes from. So um, let's go back to the slideshow. I think you're realising economics is a bit of a mess. Is that something you're getting to realise you didn't, you weren't aware of at school? There's so many conflicting ideas. Even inside individual writers, what you'll find is their views change over time. And it's... Inside, they're going to have insights which invert what they thought about beforehand. This is Keynes writing in 1937. He's written the general theory, and that interpretation of it becomes what you see in the textbooks today. But here Keynes is moving well away from the textbook view, if he ever had one, to talk about a gap between two price levels. Now, when you think about what you'd learn in micro, you only learn there's prices are set by supply and demand, correct? That's all you learn. Well, here's Keynes saying... Prices are set by a markup on costs, which itself is a bit different. And then also saying prices are set by demand price. We said demand price is based not on um, the utility you get out of something now, which is the sort of micro stuff you do, but your expectations about future profit. 
And he said, that's very volatile. So the whole idea you can work out uh, a, a stable equilibrium price, he says, doesn't apply at all when you're talking about buying investment goods or buying um, shares and property and things like that because the price you're willing to pay depends upon your expectations of the future, what's going to happen to the price of the thing you're buying. People buy a house because they expect the price to rise in the future, not just because they want to live in the house. Okay? People buy shares on the expectation that shares are going to rise in price. So these things, you simply can't do a calculus type um, trading off of marginal cost and marginal uh, utility to work out what price to pay. And what Keynes said, when you're talking about buying something as an investment good, there's no scientific basis on which to form any probability at all. You simply don't know. So how do you set a price? And this, one thing which I've found in, in dealing with people trying to understand Keynes talking about uncertainty is when Keynes talked about uncertainty, he used negative examples. He said that uncertainty about the future is not the difference between what we know for sure and what's only probable. So if you look at the talking about uh, whether Trump would win the election or not, uh, with, is that something which is, is like a – you see all the percentage odds they were predicting about the percentage likelihood of Clinton winning versus Trump? Okay. Can you put a percentage odds on something like an election? You only hold it once, don't you? You don't have – like there, there weren't 100 elections and Hillary won 30 of them and Trump won 70. Okay. There's one election and Trump won, but they were trying to give you odds beforehand. So you're trying to get a probability measure for something which you can't predict, which is uncertain. But Keynes, when he first wrote about it, didn't really have a, a positive example of uncertainty. So he said, for example, roulette's not uncertain. If you go and play a roulette wheel, there's only a certain number of slots the ball can fall into, only a certain number of red and black colours and so on. Uh, so even the weather's only slight, moderately uncertain. He was wrong about that, but that, that's another story. He said uncertainty means things like the price of copper in 30 years' time, or the state of uh, wealth owners in 1970, which when he wrote was a hell of a long way in the future. Um, he said, without those matters, we simply can't form any probability whatsoever. We simply don't know. So you can't use calculus to do it. Now, I don't see those negative examples as very useful. And I'm going to give you a positive example. This actually came from one of my students who's still a good friend a decade or two after I taught her uh, back in Sydney. And she gave this example in a seminar where she was supposed to explain what uncertainty is. And she said, well, imagine you're very attracted to someone and that person has accepted invitations from one in five of the people who've asked them out on dates in the past. Does that mean you've got a one in chance, five chance of being successful if you ask them out on a date? And uh, I can't give it anything like the present she gave for that particular issue. But of course not. Okay? Every time you have somebody's attracted to somebody else, it's a one-off thing. You simply can't use what somebody else has done in the past as any way of predicting their behaviour if you ask them out on a date. So a one on five thing is actually his thing, which is like a one on one and six. You roll the dice. It's got to come up one, two, three, four, five or six. You know that's the only options. You know it'll come up with one of those six. You know if you roll the dice often enough, you'll get all six numbers coming up roughly the same amount of the dice is fair. That's risk. But uncertainty is where you simply don't know. And you can't use the past as any guide to what's going to happen. It's something which is one-off. So the same thing applies in investments. What was successful in the past might fail today. Um, so what do you do in that situation in terms of dating? Well, her, she'd say you, you try to find out beforehand. You ask friends to eliminate that uncertainty. Uh, you do nothing. You get paralysed to an action. Or you ask anyway. You take a risk and find out what the hell happens. And the same sort of thing apply, implies to, to investment. You follow, the, you follow conventions. You follow what the herd does. Uh, and that's what, what Keynes had to say, that if you can't actually know the future, if you can't form a probability, then you're going to form expectations about that future, which are very, very fragile. So you'll, as, as, as uh, Fisher did himself, you'll expect the prices to continue rising indefinitely. Of course, what that means is your, your basis is extremely fragile. If things change, then there can be a, a total flip in the valuation of those shares. 
you don't know the future, you're making some sort of conventions, they can turn upside down. Um, so the whole idea that you see in, in, the, in the general theory itself and you'll see in your textbooks about investors deciding whether they should invest based, based on the marginal efficiency of capital and looking though compare, comparing the return they expect to get on investment to the interest rate, and if the interest rate falls there, then more investments become profitable, so they'll do more investments. You said, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how investors actually behave because you can't work out that smooth relationship to begin with. So what he said, what we actually do in that situation, we have conventions that determine how we behave as investors. So the first thing we do, and this is what Fisher himself was doing back in 1939 when he said he expected to see prices a good deal higher in a few months than they are right now, you extrapolate forward what's happened in the recent past. So you use the present as a guide to what's going to happen in the future, even though you know if you looked at that in detail, you'd find that it wasn't a reliable guide. You believe that the existing state of prices makes sense, so you accept that the share market prices and stuff like that are valid. You don't think they're out of whack. And you rely upon mass sentiment. This is where Keynes is a, is a beautiful writer when he writes when he writes freely in, in the flowing sense. He says, here, we endeavour to fall back on the judgment of the rest of the world, which is perhaps better informed. But, of course, everybody else is doing the same thing. So what you get out of this is herd behaviour. Okay? The herd, generally speaking, will push itself up in a boom and panic in a slump. And what you get as a result is financial asset prices are very, very volatile. Uh, and we saw that just over the, in the one day with Trump with the share market. I think the share market began, like the Dow Jones began about 700 points down and then finished the day about 200 points up. So the mood swings that were involved in that and the clashes of people's expectations about what America would like to be like Donald Trump were huge. It's not a case of some, you know, standard, easy, worked out, uh, knowledge of the future. So Minsky said that when he when he read Keynes, he was convinced that Keynes's ideas were similar to his, and so he brought the whole lot together: Keynes, Fisher, Schumpeter, and Marx. And he concluded capitalism is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crises, and depressions. And this is due to characteristics the financial system must have: the stuff you can't get rid of, not stuff you can reform away. And that system will be capable of generating signals that induce you to invest more and also financing that investment. And that then causes the cycles that he saw. And he eventually had what he called the, the financial instability hypothesis as this explanation of where cycles come from. So this, the starting point, he said, is you've got to imagine an economy uh, which is, has a cyclical past. So you're starting thinking about an economy that has cycles. It's not equilibrium the boom and bust stuff he got out of Sean Hader. So you have a, a cyclical economy and you're looking at the relationship between private debt and the level of income. And he said, you, you've just been through a crisis. Um, there's been a period in the few recent past where there was a crisis in the not-too-distant past. Because of that crisis, everybody is conservative about the amount of exposure they'll take in investments. So both the borrower and the lender, the, bank, the, the, the investor and the bank, are conservative about the projects that they'll, they'll put forward for funding and they'll, that they will fund. But as the economy continues doing okay after that crisis, it becomes obvious that people who took a leave position did pretty well. Because the economy has recovered, most of the investments that are put forward succeed because people are conservative about what they'll put forward, so only ones where you've worked out a fairly carefully what you think is likely to happen. You don't have ridiculous expectations. Uh, most of those projects succeed and it appears it pays to lever. So what happens is people look and say, oh, if we actually we'd borrowed more money, we would have made a larger profit. So the willingness to take on debt increases. So over a while, as an economy does well after a crisis, uh, the acceptable level of debt that you're willing to take on to finance investment rises and you get a boom driven by an increased amount of debt. And what that, that transforms the economy from an economy which is stable, has recovered from a crisis and is growing stably into a booming economy. So you get a period of, from tranquil growth, you go to excess, uh, speculative excess, um, 
And Minsky therefore said stable growth is inconsistent with how we finance investment in a capitalist economy. Because a period of stable growth means that your memory of a crisis recedes, the further you get away from the crisis, the less you worry about it. So you start to get more euphoric in your investments. And he said, therefore, the fundamental instability of a capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to transform doing wells into a speculative boom is the basic instability of a capitalist economy. So he's got this idea of crisis in the past, stable period, meaning people forget the crisis, and people who took lever positions do well. So people look at examples and say, oh, if we take on as much debt as the other firm, we would have made more money by the lever, levering up our gain. And ultimately, people think, happy days are here again, everything's wonderful, and they are willing to take on extreme positions. So you go from a, a period of recovery to a period of boom. And this is the basic sequence it goes through. He says you start with an economy in historical time. So you, you don't just have like T and T minus 1, like I showed you for that equation he was using earlier, and the stuff you do in macro as well. You take yourself in historical time. So you know there's some point in the past where there's been a major crisis. Now, for the boom and slump I've just been through, that would have been the 1990s recession in America when unemployment hit about 8%. And there was a debt crisis at that stage. On the aftermath of that crisis, everybody's conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on for investments. So they only put forward conservative projects. They're the only ones that actually get funded by banks. But because the economy is recovered, most of those projects succeed, and therefore both the firms and the banks revise the amount of risk they're willing to take on. They're willing to take on more risk, so the accepted ratio of debt to equity will rise. And that will also mean you put a higher valuation on assets. You think shares are worth more because you're expecting growth in the future. And for a while, you get self-fulfilling expectations coming out of this. So because there's a decline in your aversion to risk, there's more investment taking place the investment causes the economy to grow faster. Asset prices rise, which means you can gamble on the share market and make money. And there's an increased willingness to lend money, which actually creates more money. The money supply expands because the banks are lending. And I'll show you the logic of that later. And that enables riskier investments to take be taken on still. So you start taking on crazy investments. Ah, pardon me. This, I've got all this software to start to prevent me getting um, bu uh, bugs on the computer, and there's one I can't get rid of that keeps on coming back. Okay. So what you finally get is what Minsky calls Ponzi financiers, and these are – pardon me, get rid of this silly thing. It's a new computer, and I'm paying the price of having to install software on a new computer. Okay. Um, so you get these, what he calls Ponzi investors. Now, they're people who've got a cash flow from their investments that's less than the debt servicing cost on the investments they've got. So they've borrowed a large amount of money to buy some asset. They have to service the debt on the asset, and the cash flow from the asset is less than their interest costs. So how do they stay alive? Well, they've got to have cash because they're forever paying off their debt. Cash levels are falling. And they're trying to sell, the asset, sell that asset for a higher price than they paid for it on a rising market. So they're desperate to have money. They're willing to pay virtually any price to get to get debt, to get to get extra credit, to service their existing debts before they can sell them, sell the assets. So they become very insensitive to the rate of interest, and that will drive up interest mar interest rates in, gen in general. You also have initial – it's initially profitable to speculate on assets, which reduces people's sensitivity to debt again and drives up the supply of money. Market interest rates rise as well. What also happens is a boom will change the distribution of income. And this is a major change in how I interpret Minsky that I'll explain uh, in, in later in the lecture. As you have a boom going on, then wages are going to rise. And the cost of raw materials will rise. And you've got to pay more money to the banks as well because you have more debt as well. So you get whole range of things that undermine those expectations of profit that began the whole boom. Uh, you're paying more for, for wages and raw materials and are paying more to banks, so you've got less profit left over than you thought you'd have. There are plenty of investments out there which were, which were just gambling, Ponzi investors, uh, who are ne and they're necessarily losing money. A Ponzi financier 
has paid more for the asset than the cash flow, so they're always running down their money supply. So at some point, they may have to service the debt and not have the money to do it, and they can fold straight away. Uh, and they're normally the ones, the first ones to fall over. And you have lots of investments which were taken on, which are surely just euphoric ones. Like, for example, back in the, in the dot com bubble in America, um, there was a company called Pets.com that thought you could sell pets online. You know, click on this link and buy a dog and buy a cat and buy supplies for your dog and cat. They got an enormous valuation and, fa- and failed completely. It blew most of its money on one advertisement at the, su- at the American football Super Bowl and was then bankrupt shortly afterwards. So lots and lots of investments like that are accumulating losses. And then you have some conservative firms that were, were well, um, you know, responsibly financed, but then because interest rates have risen, suddenly their finances aren't quite so good, so they think they might sell some assets to make up their debt servicing costs, and they flood the asset market. So any of those particular factors can bring the whole thing unstuck. And the Ponzi's are the, when this happens, the Ponzi's are the first ones to fold because they can't, if asset prices are now stabilised or falling, their business plan collapses. They can't turn that loss-making situation they're in into profit because when they sell, they'll realise a loss as well. So they're the first ones to fold. Asset prices collapse. You have a general downturn in asset prices as well, which increases the ratio of debt to equity for most firms. And the expansion of the money supply that drove the whole thing also goes into reverse. Investment stops, economic growth stops as well, and you're back where you started again. So you have a boom and slump cycle, again, a bit like like Schumpeter, but then Minsky argued this goes on time and time again. You get a lot of cycles like this that finally accumulate an overwhelming level of debt. So if you have a large inflation rate, that can get you out of trouble. Because with high inflation, then the rising price level reduces the cost of servicing your debt. Even though you know the actual worth of money is declining, the, to, the main thing you're seeing is you've got more cash coming in and your debt levels are remaining constant so you can pay the debt more easily. Um, but you get, stag- you get a combination of stagnant growth and high inflation called stagflation and you've got a cycle happening again after that runs out. If you have low inflation, then Minsky said you can't repay your debts. The price level doesn't let you get out of trouble, and you can get a chain reaction of bankruptcies that wipe out even businesses which weren't speculative, so the economy can get stuck in a depression. Now, if you have big government, if the government's a large part of the economy, then it's spending, which is anti-cyclical, so government spending goes up because they put out, we've got to pay more unemployment benefits during a slump, and they get less tax revenue, so they therefore spend more money into the economy. But that will enable the economy to get out of trouble again, but you'll just go back into another cycle on the other side of it. So that was the basic argument that he had about cycles occurring. But he also expected the level of debt to continue rising. And the way over time, and the reason it rises, and I showed you that chart earlier, I'll show it to you again in a moment. The reason it rises is firms are committing to debt during a boom, but they have to repay it during a slump. Now, during the slump, they're going to have smaller cash flows than they thought they'd have when they made those commitments. So you get in the tendency for the debt level to ratchet up. It goes up and down, but it doesn't go quite down to the beginning point before the next boom takes place. And so eventually you get to the stage there's so much debt taken on that you have a crisis when debt swamps the economy. And that's Minsky's explanation for the Great Depression, how you get to the Great Depression. And it's also... You can use it to explain what happened with the financial crisis in 2007. Now, look at uh, in terms of the data. When you take a look at unemployment and inflation in the roaring 20s, what you see is the sort of phenomenon that Minsky was talking about in that unemployment was with a series of cycles in unemployment and cycles in inflation heading down, and then this explosion in unemployment and collapse in inflation. So inflation went from virtually zero to minus 10% and stay there for two or three years with huge levels of unemployment. And only World War II, occurring over here, the 1942 period on, that's what drove unemployment down to virtually zero again. People either employed fighting in the armies or producing the, the, the weapons for the armies back at home. Now, looking at 
what happened with with the level of debt, what you see is again that the phenomenon Minsky is talking about: boom and bust cycles, rising the level of debt, ratcheting up a series of small booms and small busts. Then finally, this huge explosion in debt, and then a long period of deleveraging, which took right out until the Great Depression. What I'm graphing here on the on the blue line on the right hand side is the change in debt each year. It's zero. This line along here is zero change in debt. So during the 1920s, you had this big, not as big as we've been through, but a big boom, a large amount of credit, and then credit plunged starting in 1928, went zero in 1929, and then in 1930 to 32, credit was actually negative. So rather than change in debt adding to demand, it's subtracting from demand. And then by the time we got to the 1940s, this debt level, which had started back in 1920 at 50% of GDP, peaked at about 1.3 times GDP. At the end of the Second World War, it was down to a level well below what it had been at any time in the previous 40 years. Now, when you take a look at what happened or what's been through ourselves just recently, this is the same series of the data for 1990, 1980 through to 2016. We had a series of booms and slumps with unemployment reaching a lower peak each time in each boom. So there's the unemployment peak in 1983, which is roughly 11% of the population, as it was defined at the time. 7, 8% in 1992, which was the recession that brought Bill Clinton to power. That's my mouse got to. Then in the crash, uh, the, the stock market crash in 2000, unemployment hit about 6%. And that's what conventional economists thought was going to go on forever. But Minsky saw this as being cycles, like the ones he was talking about, leading to the stage where finally you had really low inflation and too much debt and then a crash occurring. Look at the inflation rate, 15%. In 1980, 7% in 1991, 4% in 2000, trending down towards zero, then a bit of a rise before the crisis began, but then becoming minus 2% for a while after the crisis hit. So a similar sort of trend, what we saw in the 1930s, but then you take a look at the level of debt. And here's the same ratcheting up process that Minsky spoke about, where you have a boom and a bust, a boom and a bust, a boom and a bust in the level of debt. But the next boom starts from a higher level of debt than the previous one. Until we get to the level of debt we had during the 2008 crisis, which is so enormous that uh, we just had a, a, a long running slump afterwards, which would have been much worse except for government spending. So when you take a look at the change in debt, Now what I'm graphing, the blue line is graphed against the right-hand side, and that's the change in debt as percentage of GDP. The red line is the aggregate level of debt. And this, I've only got a couple of cycles shown here, but you can see huge level of debt after the 1990 crisis. It runs down, the economy, I'm trying to get my mouse to come back again, stabilises, but then you get this long boom from 1992, 1994, through to 2007, where the level of debt's rising all the way through. High level, high level of credit, so credit going from a low of 2% of GDP there to 7% to 12% to 15%, and then plunging to minus 5. And that's what causes the big downturn. And looking at the um, unemployment rate, this is a I've just actually put this graph in a moment ago because it's important to compare it. Because one, th one thing I'm trying to say is explain is how do we get Trump coming out of all this? Because if you look at the employment data right now, what it tells you is well, we're back to 4.9% unemployment rate. This is in America. And that is actually full employment as they define it in America. But there's another series which the American government also maintains called the employment to population ratio. And that gives you a completely different story. This is from a database called the FRED database. Have you heard of FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Data? I've linked it in here, and I'll, I'll put this up on study space when, uh, when I uh, finish the lecture. Let's just bring this up here, and I'll see if I can show it to you. 
Okay. It's a database you can just link into and put together data series like this very quickly. Very, very comprehensive system. So what I've put graphed here, that chart, the blue line is the unemployment rate. And you can see it peaking after the financial crisis at about 11, 10.5% of the population, 10.5% 10 unemployment rate. And then all the way down here, which is pretty much the same rate as unemployment that you had before the crisis began. So from the point of view of Washington, you know, the economy is back to a boom level again and everybody's got a job. Why is anybody complaining? But this graph here is the employment ratio, looking at the number of people who have a job divided by the population of people aged between 25 and 54. And you look at that, that peaked at 80% of the 25 to 54 year olds in America had a job before the crisis began. That plunged down to 75%. It's now back up to 77%, but that's still 3% below where it was before the crisis began. So you've got two pieces of data telling you a very different story about the state of the American labour market. Can you guess as to why those two series differ? Why don't they tell exactly the same story? Any ideas? Has anybody been surveyed? Have you, do anybody been surveyed for unemployment in England? Have you had a, a survey done of yourselves about whether you're unemployed or not? Do you know what the questions are when they ask you whether you're when they try to work out whether you're employed or unemployed? Well, what's one obvious question that I ask, ask you, which would rule you out of being part of the workforce? Pardon? Yeah. You have a, well, I, you, you don't have a job, but what else are you doing? You're studying, okay? As soon as you say you're studying, you're not part of the workforce. So they drop you out of the workforce. Um, but how many? How much work do you have to do before they regard you as having a job? Any idea? I don't know the English situation. I know the American. If you say you've done one hour of employed, paid or unpaid work in the previous two weeks, they count you as employed. Okay? Now, the German definition, I think, you've got to do 20 hours work in the previous week before they count you as employed. So the Americans have an incredibly low level. As soon as you have one hour of employed work or, or even work where you're not paid, the volunteer work. If you say you did volunteer work at a, the church, that's enough to get you ruled as being employed. And they also uh, have a definition, this particular definition, if you're being unemployed for more than a year, they record you as no longer unemployed. So there's a huge difference in these two data series. This one on, other, on the other side asks employers, how many staff have you got? So one is asking employed people with all sorts of limitations on whether they regard you as employed or not. That mean you have a, you get an artificially low rate of unemployment recorded. This one's realistic, saying how many workers have a, have a job? So there's a huge difference between the two series. And I think Washington fooled itself to believing this described the real world. When the people who voted for Trump, this described the real world. So a major factor in why there's such a political surprise to Washington, because they, they think that the crisis is over. I'm going to get fairly technical on you for a while here, so apologies for that. Um, we'll see how we go. I, just want to, I haven't got a lot of time here because of the, um, getting the module feedback, but I want to show how you can actually model some of what goes on with Minsky. And... This is, again, because modelling how these things happen lets you understand the dynamics. It's, it's part of the, the logic of working out whether a um, whether the economist theories make sense. And you've been doing equilibrium modelling so far. Have I shown you this Romeo and Juliet example before? I don't think I have. That's okay. I want to give you an example of a dynamic system to show you don't have to think equilibrium to model properly. So imagine you've got a couple that you know, uh, one who's Romeo, who um, I'm going to model the, the love each, each one of them has for the other being a function of their love and the other person's love. So I've got Romeo being a person who um, um, tends to forget Juliet when she's not around. So I've got this coming up. So I have, oh, pardon me, go back up again. So I have Romeo being somebody who tends to forget Juliet when she's not about. Okay? But when she's around, enjoys her company.
Whereas Juliet fantasizes about Romeo when he's not there, but when he is, he annoys her. Does that sound like a realistic situation for a relationship? It's possible. Okay. So I'm just going to use simple numbers to measure all this and simple numbers to me measure whether you have love or hate or indifference, you know, zero for indifference, etc., etc. I put it together, and on one of these days I'll get a chance to take you through how to use this software of mine. Uh, let's make it a bit bigger here. But what I've got is this flowchart saying Romeo's love for Juliet is a function of his current affection to her, which decays when she's not around, multiplied by, which is the so A is a negative number. I'll just actually drag that down a bit so you can see the number more clearly. Minus 0.5 I've got there. Times the positive number times how much she loves him if she's about. So he's, you know, forgets her when she's not there, enjoys her company, so falls more for when she's about. Juliet, on the other hand, fantasizes about Romeo, so he's not about her love for him grows. But if he's around, he annoys her, so the affection falls. Realistic situation? Okay. What's going to happen when I simulate it? What do you think is going to be the end outcome? They're going to end up hating each other, loving each other, being indifferent. What do you think? Who goes for hating each other? Okay. okay. Loving each other? Not caring about each other? Okay. Okay. What you get is actually cycles. They go from loving each other to hating each other, back to loving each other. It goes on forever. Okay. Now, that's the, that's the simple way to model a dynamic system where it, the system changes over time. Okay. And that's what I'm doing in economics these days, building software that does that sort of thing. I'll give you a more serious example. Given the amount of time up, I might just page on to that particular... Uh, hang on. Where'd that get to? That shouldn't have jumped me back to that point. Okay, let's go forward. Okay, this is a weather model. And have you heard what's called the, 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 the idea of a butterfly's wings causing a, a hurricane in, in America? on a stove, if you have water in a pot and you see these cycles occurring in the water, then it only has three variables and three constants to it. You wouldn't imagine it can give you much of a complex looking outcome. But it's much the same logic as I've shown you for the Romeo and Juliet example. And you simulate it and nothing happens because you're in equilibrium. So let's just pause that and just disturb it a tiny distance from equilibrium and see what happens. There's one equilibrium. You see what's happening? It's moving away from the equilibrium. It's, this is, it started from equilibrium over here. Uh, it's cycling around and moving away from one of the equilibria here. But rather than breaking down, it then cycles around another one, and this cycle will go on indefinitely. So dynamic systems like the economy don't have to be in equilibrium, and you don't have to think about it in an equilibrium sense. So this is one thing I'm trying to get economics to appreciate, myself and quite a few others, that thinking about a model in equilibrium can be completely distorted the reality of the world because we're not in equilibrium at any particular point. So we need to think in a non-equilibrium way. And that's what you saw happening in that chart. That model will go on indefinitely. It will never reach those the three equilibria, which are, there's my mouse got to again, there you go, there, there, and there, are three places the model will never be. So thinking in equilibrium is a major distortion of your attempt to actual model reality. So... I'm going to build a simple model like that now for Minsky. And so imagine you have an amount of capital determining how much output gets produced, output determining how many workers you need to employ for the factory, 
the employment rate that gives you determining how fast wages change, so Phillips curve. Uh, output minus wages being profit. Profit determining how much investment occurs and investment's the rate of change of the capital stock. That's a simple dynamic model. So if I put that together mathematically, I'm going to say output is some fraction, uh, some ratio of the amount of capital employed. Labor is some ratio of output, which depends on labor productivity. I've got an argument about unemployment determining how much wages change. Profit being output minus wages. Investment depending upon how much profit differs from a desired rate of profit. And then the rate of change of capital being investment minus depreciation. Put that together. And I'm trying to find my mouse here. Here we go. Ah, that should have loaded, but it didn't. Okay. What you get is cycles, model cycles, and definitely like I've shown you in the one for um, for um, uh, the weather system. But it actually comes from a set of definitions that are completely true. I'm going to add a financial sector inside there now to say that the percentage amount of debt in the economy will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. What I've got here is debt is used to finance investment. So what I get out of that is that firms borrow money to finance investment during a boom, have to pay it down during a slump. So I've simply got investment now depending upon the rate of profit. And when they have, when their desire to invest exceeds their profits, they borrow money. Okay? Quite simple, the logic. So profit now is profit minus output minus wages minus interest payments. If I simulate that, let's hope I've got it right so I can actually click on it this time. Good. Okay. This is spelling it out in detail here. So here I have output divided by labour productivity gives you the employment rate. Employment divided by population. So that's the level of employment. Divided by population gives the employment rate. If I subtract the level at which work workers don't demand wage rises from the actual employment rate, then I get whether they're going to want wage rises or or wage, except wage cuts, and there's then a, a slope, a function saying how much they react to that. Do they have a one-for-one one reaction, a two-to-one two one reaction for the difference between the employment rate and the zero rate? Will they? What sort of wage rise will they want? That gives you your Phillips curve. Multiply that by the wage rate and integrate it. You get the wage level. Multiply that by employment. You get the wage bill. Subtract the wage bill from output and interest payments, you get profit. Divide profit by the level of capital, you get the profit rate. Feed that into an investment function, you get how much investment is going to occur. If the desired investment exceeds profit, then they borrow money. They have to pay money on the, on the, uh, on the money they borrow, pay interest, and you've got to deduct that from output as well to get profit. And you run that model, and you get cycles. But you also get a rising level of debt, as you can see here. I'll make it go a bit slow, more slowly. And it looks like you're heading towards equilibrium. But then you start to get crazy cycles as well. So this is a very simple way of modelling Minsky, Minsky's hypothesis about a series of booms and busts leading to a final level of debt being taken on that causes a total catastrophe. And that's what we saw happening in the, um, in the 1930s, and we've had it again with what's happened in 2007. And now, of course, I think that's a major reason why Trump has got the appeal he has today, because in the aftermath of that, you have a high level of unemployment, low wages, massive inequality, and that's really the formula that I think has given us Trump. Well, let's take go. Uh, that's the, I think I've got to get out of here before the next lecture class arrives. So I'll see you in the tutorial. Let's have a bit of talk about Trump and so on. And I'll set some reading for next week to give you more detail on where Minsky came from and where Keynes also came from. <laughs>